You will hear a number of different recordings, and you'll have to answer questions on what you hear. There'll be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you'll have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you'll be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a telephone conversation between a male insurance agent and a female client who wants to make changes to her policy. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning, Tauber Insurance Company. How can I help you? Good morning. I want to alter my insurance policy. Is that for your house, contents, or vehicle? My vehicle. Can you give me the number of the policy, please? Certainly, I have it here in front of me. It's ZQW five o o nine. And what make and model of car is it? It's a Mazda, a Mazda Marvel. And what's the CC rating? Sorry, what do you mean? How big is the engine? Is it one thousand five hundred? Or one thousand eight hundred cc, for example. Oh, that! It's actually much bigger than that. It's two thousand five hundred cc. Thank you. Now I just have to ask you a few questions to verify your identity. What name is the policy under? Heathcote. Let me just bring that up on the computer. Yes. Can I just confirm your first name, please? Well, my first name is Lisa. But I'm known by my middle name, Marie. Right. I see both here, but Lisa is the one I want for ID purposes. And your date of birth, Lisa? I mean, Marie. The twenty-second of August, nineteen fifty-five. Correct. Just one more question before we get started. Can you remember the password on this policy? Oh dear, I didn't know I had a password on it. Everyone has a password. Would you like to take a guess? Possibly, it's my mother's name. And what would that be? Sophia. Sorry, guess again. All right. Oh, I remember now. It's my grandfather's name, Jack. Yes, followed by some numbers. One eight nine seven, right? Correct. Now we can get down to business. What exactly do you want to change? Well, a couple of things. Firstly, I think it's overvalued at the moment. Can we reduce the value by five thousand dollars? You mean bring it down to fifteen thousand dollars? Yes, I'm sure it's lost quite a bit of value over the past year. Done. Now, what's the other thing? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten.
Well, I want to add the name of another driver to my insurance policy. Who is it? His name is Samuel Michaels. He doesn't have the same family name as you. No, he doesn't. Is that a problem? No, it shouldn't be, as long as he's over the age of 25. But we find it easier to get approval for family members. Oh, he is family. He's married to my daughter. He's my son in law. And he's 28, in fact. Good. And what would he be using the car for? Would it be business or social purposes? Not really. You see, I've injured my right arm and I'm having difficulty driving. It's not an automatic. I have to use the gear stick. And Sam, that is Samuel, offered to drive me to my appointments and so on. He's a good driver and I feel safe with him, but I'd like to know that the car is still insured with him behind the wheel. So that would be family reasons then? Yes, I think so. Will my premium go up? No, as long as you can provide us with a photocopy of his driver's license. A true copy. You know what I mean. You'll have to get someone from the Department of Transport to sign it, saying that he's seen the original document. I think we can manage that without any difficulty. Oh, and while he's at the department, he should ask them for a record of any driving offences, demerit points, that kind of thing. Only for the last five years, though. We're not interested in anything beyond that, but it's important that he has a clean record for the five previous years. Oh, I'm sure that won't be a problem. Is there anything else you need? Just the date for when you'd like this to take effect. Today, if that's possible. Yes. We can issue temporary cover from today's date, but full cover won't apply until we've received the paperwork and it's been approved. What exactly is temporary? He'll be covered for two full weeks, but it will lapse after that time if there's any problem with his credentials. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2 You will hear a man taking a group of tourists around a museum site. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Uh, welcome to Brampton Museum. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the museum first and then show you around. As you can see, Brampton is an open-air museum. The first open-air museums were established in Scandinavia towards the end of the 19th century, and the concept soon spread throughout Europe and North America, and there are several in Britain, all of which tell the history of a particular part of the country. Brampton focuses on life during the 19th century. The site was chosen because there were already some historic 19th century buildings here and others have been dismantled in different parts of the region and rebuilt on the site. This hadn't been attempted before in these parts, so we're very proud of what we have here. All of the buildings are filled with furniture, machinery and objects. 
you may be able to see these in other museums, but not in their original settings. What also sets Brampton apart from other museums is that the story of the exhibits is told not by labels, but by costumed staff like myself. I look after sheep, cows and hens, which are much the same as those you see on modern farms, but I use traditional methods to care for them. You will also be able to see a blacksmith and a printer, as well as other craftspeople. If you talk to them, you'll be able to find out what life was really like 150 years ago. Our programme of activities during the year has guided walks, an agricultural fair, and all the other events you would expect a museum to have. But remember, here you experience them in the real surroundings. The site is divided into different areas. The main building contains our high street, which is a street of 19th century shops, offices and some homes. There's a stationer's shop which sells a range of specially selected cards, prints and copies of Victorian stationery, all available for purchase by visitors. Upstairs, in the same building, a printer demonstrates the production of posters, business cards and advertising material. Across the street from the stationers is a clothes shop and there's a baker's where you can watch a demonstration of someone making bread, cakes and pastries. We also have a sweet shop which has old-fashioned sweets for sale. Vintage trams travel along from one end of the street to the other carrying visitors on their journey into the past. We will also be visiting the farm and taking a ride on a steam train. Of course, the main form of transport in those days was the horse, and you can watch horses being exercised in the old stables. This part of Britain was famous for coal mining, and on the site we have part of a mine which opened in 1860 and was worked for over a hundred years, before closing in 1963. Visitors can put on a hard hat and take a guided tour underground to see how coal was worked and to experience the working conditions in the early 1900s. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now, if you'd like to look at your map, we'll begin our tour. The site is a bit like a circle, with the railway going round the edge. You can see where we are now by the entrance, and we're going to start by walking to the high street. We'll go to the crossroads in the middle of the map, and go straight on, making our way between two buildings on either side of the path. The larger one is an exhibition centre but it's not open today, unfortunately. The other building is offices. The path leads directly to the High Street building, which is at the opposite side of the site to the entrance. Here you're free to wander around and take a ride up and down on a tram. <laughs> we'll then take the path which follows the railway line and crosses it to the farm. If you wish, you can have tea in the farmhouse and there'll be time to look at the animals and the machinery. Then we cross the railway line again and visit our special attraction, which is the coal mine. It's just in front of us, here at the entrance. We'll return to the crossroads and walk through a small wooded area to the manor house. This is one of the original buildings on the site and belonged to a wealthy farmer. You can look round the house and gardens and talk to our guides who can tell you what it was like to live there. 
We will then follow a path which goes past the pond and will take us to the railway station, which is situated between the path and the railway line. Finally, we'll take the steam train back around the site, passing alongside the high street and the coal mine back to the entrance. So, if you'd like to follow me... That is the end of section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3 Section 3. You will hear two students discussing a science project. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Julia. Hi, Bob. Thought about the science project yet? Which one? The presentations are scheduled for next month. The experiments that you and I are working on to demonstrate density, buoyancy and the compression of gases. That'll be complicated. Well, it's not supposed to be. It'll be part of the Making Science Simple series that's being showcased next year, and we have to be ready to demonstrate by the end of next week. Oh, well, simple, you say? Yes, not just the concept, but the materials too. We have to use cheap, readily available common items. Expensive lab equipment is out of the question. I remember something about using recycled or throwaway items if possible. Anything portable that we can bring into the lab. That's right. Well, any ideas for the project? What about the classic Cartesian diver? Is that the same as a Cartesian devil? The invention named after the famous French physicist René Descartes? Yes. A long time ago, superstitious people labelled it that because they couldn't comprehend the scientific principles it demonstrated. They thought it was black magic. How shall we do it? By keeping it as simple, transparent and economical as possible. So, to start with... Open your pencil case and let's have a look. Hmm, you haven't got any... Any what? Paper clips. Oh. There are lots of them in the bottom of my bag. They slip off my papers and collect in the bottom. Look, here's half a dozen. But they're all big metal ones. I want little ones. Small, vinyl-covered, multicoloured ones. Oh, I've got one or two of them too. Great, and if we look around, especially on the floor, we're bound to find a few more. See, here. What else do we need? A small rubber band. Well, I've got one of those in my pocket. No, not that kind. Let's go and ask Tara. Why? Those really small coloured bands for making ponytails are ideal. Hey, Tara. Yes? Have you got any spare rubber bands, like the ones you fasten your hair with? Oh, heaps. A whole packet full. Help yourselves. Terrific. So far, it hasn't cost us anything. What now? Let's go and rummage through the recycling bins beside Joe's Mini Market. What for? We want a two-litre 
plastic soft drink bottle with lid. Hey, I draw the line at sorting through other people's rubbish, and we're also not likely to find one with a lid. Well, go into the store and buy two liters of soft drink. What flavor? It doesn't matter what kind of drink you get. Just make sure it comes in a clear PET bottle. Where are you going? To the cafeteria behind the resource center. What for? I'm after some straws. I can get them from the shop when I buy the drink. No, I've seen theirs. They're the waxed paper ones. We need clear plastic, and I know they've got them in the cafeteria. I'll also see if I can get a tall plastic cup from there. Good luck. Meet you back here in five minutes. Maybe longer because I want to go over to my locker and get a wire coat hanger. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Right, have we got everything now? I think so. I've got extras of most things, so don't worry if this doesn't work first time. Okay. Assembly. Step one. Take a straw and fold it in two. No, not like that. These plastic ones are quite hard to fold. Try pinching it in the middle. That should make it easier to bend. You may even have to bite it, but not too hard. You want a sharp crease, but you don't want to break it. How's this? Good. Now, second step: wrap a rubber band several times around the ends to hold them together. Then, add weight to the diver. So this straw is the diver. Yes. See how I'm pulling the outside end of a paperclip out a bit. Now hook the part I bent out into the rubber band that's holding the straw together. No, not that way. It'll fall off. That's right. Turn it over. Now hook two or three more paperclips on. It's hard to say how many we'll need. The idea is to get the diver to be almost all the way submerged, but not quite. We can put it in this tall cup of water to test it. Hmm. What do you think? Too buoyant. Add another paperclip. I think so. Okay. On to the next step. Have you got the empty bottle? Not quite. What do you mean? Well, it's not quite empty. Pour some into this cup for later. Good. Now fill the bottle with water all the way to the top, and we'll gently lower the diver in. Great. Now put the cap back on. And then, the final step is the demonstration of our experiment. You will see that when I squeeze the bottle, the diver sinks, and when I let it go, the diver rises. When you squeeze. The air bubble trapped in the straw compresses, and the water rushes in, making it heavier, so it sinks. And the reverse happens when you release the bottle. What's the coat hanger for? Oh, that! If our experiment didn't work the first time and our divers stayed on the bottom, we'd have had to fish it out with a piece of wire or a hook of some kind. It's best to be prepared. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Section 4 You will hear a lecturer talking about the history of the electric guitar. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. During today's lecture in this series about the history of popular music, I'm going to look at the different stages the electric guitar went through before we ended up with the instrument we know so well today. The driving force behind the invention of the electric guitar was simply the search for a louder sound. In the late 1890s, Orville Gibson, founder of the Gibson Mandolin Guitar Manufacturing Company, designed a guitar with an arched or curved top, as is found on a violin. This made it both stronger and louder than earlier designs, but it was still hard to hear amongst other louder instruments. During the 1920s, with the beginnings of big band music, commercial radio, and the rise of the recording industry, the need to increase the volume of the guitar became even more important. Around 1925, John Dapiera came up with a solution. He designed a guitar known as the National Guitar with a metal body which had metal resonating cones built into the top. It produced a brass tone which became popular with guitarists who played blues but was unsuitable for many other types of music. Another way of increasing the volume was thought of in the 1930s. The C.F. Martin Company became known for its Dreadnought, a large, flat-top acoustic guitar that used steel strings instead of the traditional gut ones. It was widely imitated by other makers. These mechanical fixes helped, but only up to a point. So, guitarists began to look at the possibilities offered by the new field of electronic amplification. What guitar players needed was a way to separate the guitar's sound and boost it in isolation from the rest of a band or the surroundings. Guitar makers and players began experimenting with electrical pickups, which are the main means of amplification used today. The first successful one was invented in 1931 by George Beecham. He introduced to the market a guitar known as the frying pan because the playing area consisted of a small round disc. The guitar was hollow and was made of aluminum and steel. He amplified the sound by using a pair of horseshoe-shaped magnets. It was the first commercially successful electric guitar. So by the mid-1930s, an entirely new kind of sound was born. Yet along with its benefits, the new technology brought problems. The traditional hollow body of a guitar caused distortion and feedback when combined with electromagnetic pickups. Musicians and manufacturers realized that a new kind of guitar should be designed from scratch with amplification in mind. In 1935, Adolf Rickenbacker produced a guitar which took his name, the Rickenbacker Electro-Spanish. It was the first guitar produced in plastic, which because of its weight, vibrated less readily than wood. It eliminated the problems of earlier versions which were plagued by acoustic feedback. The Electro-Spanish had its own problems, however, because it was very heavy, smaller than other guitars of the period, and was quite awkward to play. Developments continued, and in 1941, Les Paul made a guitar which he called the Log, and true to its name, it was totally solid. All previous guitars had been hollow or partly hollow. 
It looked slightly strange, but the next step had been made towards the modern electric guitar. The first guitar successfully produced in large numbers was made in 1950 by Leo Fender. His Spanish-style electric guitar, known as a Fender Broadcaster, had a bolt-on neck and was initially criticized by competitors as being very simple and lacking in craftsmanship. Yet it was immediately successful and was particularly suited to mass production, spurring other guitar companies to follow Fender's lead. In 1951, Leo Fender revolutionized the music world yet again when he produced an electric bass guitar. This was the first commercially successful bass model to be played like a guitar. It was easier for players to hit an exact note. That's why it was called the Precision. Although there had already been electric stand-up basses, this was much more portable. It is now standard in the lineup of any rock band, and some historians suggest that entire genres of music, such as reggae and funk, could not exist without it. In 1952, the Gibson Company became Fender's first major competitor when Ted McCarty created the Gibson Les Paul guitar. It was distinctive because it was colored gold. The reason for this was to disguise the fact that it was made from two different kinds of wood. In 1954, Leo Fender responded to this successful instrument by introducing the Fender Stratocaster. It is easily identified by its double cutaway design and three pickups. This model may be the most influential electric guitar ever produced. The modern guitar as we know it was here to stay. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.